Welcome to the 2022 Annual Meeting with the Portsmouth Historical Society. I'm Ann Burns, the President. This is, uh, according to our bylaws, um, we have our, to hold an annual meeting every year to give you an update of our progress. Um, and because you're here, you're helping us fulfill our mission of sharing um, Portsmouth history. So we thank you very much for your support and for being here. Uh, the idea of this is we are going to give you a flavor of what we've done over the last year to move through it rather quickly. We did not end up putting in pretty pictures because you'll see there's a lot of information packed on here. So I'm going to just sort of highlight some things on screens. If you could save your uh, any questions that you have or comments you have until the end, um, that would be wonderful. So without further ado, I'd like to ask all of our um, Officers and directors that are here, if you could stand and say hello. I'm Ann Northup Burns. We have Craig Clark, Bill Douglas, Kerry McCullough, Fred Schlipsky, Sandy Resendiz, who's in Cambodia on business, Dave Duggan, Sarah Nekraz, Becky Sattel, Jim Garman, Gary Crosby, Dave Gleason, Stephen Luce, and Jerry Macumber. So, big round of applause. We are, we are actually very lucky. The talent, you know, the knowledge, the dedication of this group of people is second to none and it's an all-volunteer organization, so we really appreciate everything they do. And it took literally 20 people to put tonight together, um, for which I personally am very appreciative of everyone's efforts. Um, we have an amazing list of docents and volunteers here. It's quite a few, but, we, we, but we'd love to see your name up on here next year. Um, so 2022 initiatives. Again, I'm not going to... Um, read through everyone because we do want to get to the future presentation and it would take too long. This is being videotaped. We also will have a hard copy for any, if, if any of you are so excited and you want to see it again, we can send you a PDF version, uh, version of this. But a couple of the things, um, there are sort of normal routine businesses that, uh, business opportunities uh, that we provided for our members um, and you can see uh, this is how, these are the key points of things that we um, do throughout the year. One thing that's really cool that they started last year, um, the Portsmouth Rhode Island Historic Photo Page, we have 1,600 followers that we've gotten in a year, 114 posts, 35,974 views. If you are on Facebook and you haven't checked that out yet, that yet it's really popular. Jim Garman provides most of the content. There's an, a person by the name of Richard Pimentel. I'm not sure if he's here. He also has some really interesting things, but it's a, it's, it's a lot of fun and it's one of the ways we fulfill our mission to get uh, information out there. Our 2023 uh, initiatives, the top of our list is our website. We are going to update our website and sort of our technology, you know, backroom technology. Um, we're continuing with the project of putting historical signage at key sites around town. We uh, have that in our budget already. Um, one of the things I was not able to do tonight that we will do in a more formal way is recognition of members and donors at different giving levels. We have had a gap in uh, our administrative assistant. Um, did, is she on that last slide? Oh yes, we had a gap, uh, a turnover in our administrative position, assistant position and I didn't want to forget anybody, but rest assured, we really want to thank all of our members personally and all of our donors. But let me go back to the top one there that I skipped over. Um, we had, for the first time last year, a paid administrative assistant position, and we just expanded that role to an administrative coordinator, coordinator who will handle more duties. Uh, Judy Costa is from Portsmouth. She was a very high-level um, secretary at Raytheon for many, many years. She, they're, they're, her house is battling COVID again, so she couldn't be here tonight, but that's a very, she's gonna be terrific. And, a lot of fun to work with too. Um, 2023 initiatives, one thing you'll be happy about is we're still struggling to find better ways for parking. Um, whether we make an arrangement with the people across the street, Rocco's is nice enough to have us there. Um, but we want to, we're very cognizant of the fact that, that we have a, a 200 seat um, church here that we can't fully uh, seat 200 people because we can't park them right now. Um, but that is something that's high on our list. We're installing a new septic system. We're completing a security system upgrade. 
working on the comprehensive, the town of Portsmouth um, has a comprehensive community plan uh, that the Historical Society is involved with some of the initiatives there. Continuing research on Portsmouth history, stories, and people, we are making progress on oral histories where we are um, interviewing and recording some of our uh, senior statesmen in town and capturing all of their stories. That's a very fun project. Um, and then we have, we're going to conduct a paid executive director feasibility study to see if it makes sense to have somebody above the board that can really, you know, man all the operations for us. If you've been following along, you'll know that last June I announced that I would be uh, stepping away from the president position at the end of December. I'll stay on the board through June for a transition, but there will be a new president search, but Becky Sattel and Craig Clark will be leading going forward as co-vice presidents. And that Portsmouth flag that I keep talking about, the color is almost perfect. It's not there yet. But for Founders Day, there will be flags for sale. Um, 2022 lectures. We have an average attendance of 65 people. We actually have more than that sometimes. Um, and I think that's a real testament to our Jim Garman who's, uh, and Stephen Luce, who's um, Lectures are so well researched and have a lot of illustrations to them. Um, it, there's a lot of competition for content and events and activities on the Quinnick Island and nearby. Uh, and a lot of other organizations are pretty impressed that we attract this kind of attendance at, at lectures. So we're very happy about that and we thank you. I, I, I know a lot of you come to a lot of them. We really do appreciate it. It's, it's, the, it's what we love to do and we thank Jim especially for providing that. 22 events, the Portsmouth History Trivia Contest, um, very competitive. Watch for it, study for it, be there. All the tables were filled, we're having it again. We do this Founders Day celebration. Stephen Luce has conducted some members only uh, cemetery tours and Melville Park historical walking tours. He, he does a really wonderful job. They're members only, they book out. We've repeated them and we'll, you'll see we're repeating them again. Um, the historic 33 star flag showing, we put it up on Facebook, it's not one of the flags that's up here now, but it gained like New England attention, a Boston uh, news outlet picked it up, we get inquiries all the time. We knew that it might be something kind of special, our flag collection, and it turns out, as you'll find out, it, it really is. Um, we already have some dates in the books coming up. Um, and again, you'll see, you'll get newsletters and uh, we, we do a pretty good job of advertising these, but we actually have some already um, date certain and you'll see some of the things that are really popular we're going to uh, repeat. And there'll, be, and there'll be more, believe it or not, there may be more, but this is what we've got on the book so far. Um, now I'd like to introduce Bill Douglas, our treasurer, who will come up and do a brief highlight of our financials. If I may, I'll just stand here if everybody can hear me. And and, and <coughs> mentioned at the onset that we're going to include some pretty pictures. Here's some. Here's a pretty picture. Uh, uh, our our position, particularly as we came out of the pandemic and everything that we all experienced, uh, not being able to get together and not be able to enjoy cultural institutions uh, like we have here. Um, we, with your support, the members, uh, and continued support from the town of Portsmouth and other grantors. Uh, have remained strong. So our total assets at, as of the end of uh, this past fiscal year were over $660,000. Uh, and if I may, I'll go to the next income statement and just highlight, as I, as I mentioned, uh, membership dues and donations continue to be the bread and butter of, of society's uh, income and, and revenue, in addition to the grant sources who, and she may still be, she's in the back, but I do want to give a special shout out to Becky Sattel, who has been leading our grant writing efforts and is masterful at it and, and, and helped us uh, not only in the past year, but, but also with some of the initiatives that can highlighted uh, that are on, on our to-do list for coming up. Um, downstairs on some of the tables, I've uh, included some little postcards. Those of you that are shopping for the holidays using Amazon, uh, the Portsmouth Historical Society is one of our, is one of Amazon's smile beneficiaries. So if you're pointing and clicking and buying, you can identify 
the historical society as a recipient of, of this program, uh, akin to the uh, sales slips that Clements does. Mm -hmm. It's a similar type of program. Uh, but Amazon Smile, we, we hope to be able to in increase that sort of free money uh, as, as you purchase things online. Any questions? Can I just speak to that Amazon Smile piece? Sure. Uh, my business uses Amazon Smile. I'm afraid we don't support the Historical Society. We support a different charity in town. But it, it gets you 350 bucks a year just from us yeah. buying on Amazon. Yeah. Um, you just need to select the Historical Society as your Smile recipient. And we would never want to compete with another organization, but we'd be honored to be on your list. <laughs> and and we also do support buying local and supporting our sponsors, but the reality is a lot of people also shop on Amazon. So, um, just Thank a you. shout out to our locals. I add my my uh, my appreciation again on behalf of the board uh, for your continued support. Yes, uh, you're helping us to accomplish some, some amazing things, uh, and we'll perhaps allude to it in terms of our our call for volunteers. Uh, we are in a position where we, we need to do more with programming and events, and, and that is done with staffing, with, with extra hands on deck. Um, and we have we budgeted the resources to get those types of things done. So please give us your consideration as you look to do uh, to line up your to-do list for coming here. Thank you. And, and, and we'll do this at the end too, but of course I will be asking you for end of the year donations, and I have forms already set up downstairs, but we'll get to that as the last slide. Okay, um, so grants and large donations. Um, this year they totaled 38265 and again a big thank you to um, Bill and Becky for um, getting the grants. This is wonderful money and it's opportunity for us to do big projects around here. One of them um, being uh, we are going to have to replace our schoolhouse roof and we, are, we do have to put in a septic system. So, you know, those are some of the larger ones that we have going on. And again, those are some... some um, very much appreciated. Uh, buildings and grounds. Um, it doesn't just happen. We have the lovely Dave Duggan who pays attention to a lot of things that happened uh, that happened around here. One of the things we're continuously working on is our lighting. We do realize it's a little bit dark outside and a little dark in the uh, the pathway. It didn't used to be as much of a problem because we used to only be opened from May until October. And now that we're open longer and it's darker earlier, it's become more of a, a burning issue. So we are absolutely doing that. We had, um, we had Alec Tessa come in and he gave us a, a plan to upgrade our lighting. And it's very expensive. We'll probably be looking for a grant for that as well. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Craig Clark Butts Hill, to talk about um, Butts Hill Fort. The Historical Society has been involved with Butts Hill Fort for a probably a hundred years now on and off with efforts that they've done that there. Um, we started this about a year ago. No, you can. Um, but anyway, this is Bill. This is, uh, welcome Craig Clark. He's going to talk a little bit about what's happening now. Are you going to stand there or come here? Uh, I'll just stand right here. Uh, I think you started a hundred years ago. I think I think I was the first one. Terry, right. Uh, just as a review, in, in August 2020, the Historical Society and during COVID, we're getting a lot of interest in Bus Hill Fort. So we held an event in August of 2020 just to see what sort of interest in the community there was to help restore the fort. There was enough interest that in January of 21, we formed the Bus Hill Fort Restoration Committee on the left hand side. And that really took off very well. We had very, we immediately had 13 members that wanted to help restore the fort and start some land clearings. To date, we have created, had four, four volunteer land clearings. We've performed an archeological survey, uh, topographical data as well. We have a master plan in progress right now that we'll have published, we believe, January, Paul. I think January will have that, and we plan on presenting that to the town council first quarter 2023. One thing that was bothering the group just during this whole event was that, okay, so there's been a numerous of times where we tried to restore the fort in the history of the town, 1976 and different times earlier, but it was never maintained. And there was such a lack in online presence with the Battle of Rhode Island and um, the Siege of Newport that it was decided that let's take this effort wider, statewide, because we just felt like 
Rhode Island is just underrepresented considering the significance of the battle. So we decided to create the Battle of Rhode Island Association, and that was created this, this past year. We launched in 2022. And now there's 32 members, associate partner members, either website associations or members, um, different associations and um, museums. Portsmouth is one of those museums. I'm also the director representing Portsmouth in the Battle of Rhode Island Association. So the ultimate goal here is that we're going to restore the fort, represent the state in 2026 and 2028, and create along with raising the funds necessary to maintain that fort in, per in perpetuity. So that's the ultimate goal. And uh, happy to answer any quick questions if you have any. Yes, sir. Oh, the website. We now have, I, I would say, the best uh, website pertaining to the Battle of Rhode Island, Battle of Rhode Island and Siege of Newport. And with, and this is sort of first phase, and the idea is to have different links to all the different associations. As Maria will mention, the Barnum Armory, General Barnum. Um, we have 32 different partners associated with that right now. So we want to be a one-stop shop for education and um, the tourism, really. You know, we, we, everyone, we pass by Buttsill Fort on the way to Newport, and it, it's, a, it's the largest remaining earthen, uh, earthen fort in New England. People say second, I say, I say first. You know, it's pretty different here. Yeah. But anyway. Yes, sir? Who owns the fort? The town of Portsmouth is the, is the owner of the fort. It was originally given to the Newport, Newport Historical Society, and then the state took it over, and it was given back to the, uh, Portsmouth in 1967? 1960s. All right, thank you so much. Okay, thank We're, you very much. Uh, <laughs> so, a uh, museum update and featured program. We're doing really well on time. I hope I'm not rushing too fast. But I'd like to introduce our curator, um, Carrie McCullough, who's going to give us a, an update on the museum and present our featured program. Great. Yeah, this is the only slide now, right? Yes. Yeah, great. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, yes, I'm going to speak very briefly before we get into tonight's uh, featured program that I know we're all excited about. Um, just wanted to recap some curatorial highlights this year. And of course, the big one is that we finally reopened after a two-year hiatus. So we were all very excited about that. I uh, hope you had the chance to uh, visit the museum and see all of our new exhibits. Um, and be sure to check out, we also installed a new exhibit on our uh, historic schoolhouses at the Portsmouth Public Library, so be sure to check that out as well. Um, and we'll see you in early spring 2023. We hope to open a little bit earlier this year, or next year rather. Um, quickly, I wanted to highlight the uh, acquisitions to our collection that we received this year. Uh, we re received a Revolutionary War cannonball from uh, Mr. David Reese. Mrs. Nancy Wake donated a mantle clock built by Seth Thomas. Mr. Stephen Moss donated a 1920s uh, table water container and cradle, which is really neat. Uh, we received an 1885 map of Aquidneck Island through the estate of Vernon and Elizabeth Harvey. Uh, Mr. John Woodhouse donated a set of banners from the Portsmouth Lions Club. We actually have an old photograph of the Lions Club meeting with a lion in the picture as well. Um, earlier this year, the Soci Society purchased at auction an 1864 lithograph of um, the Lovell General Hospital in Portsmouth, uh, and we have it on display for you downstairs. Um, and finally, we have um, a 19th century brig model built by Captain Alfred uh, Chase that was donated through the generosity of Mr. and Mrs. David Chase. Um, they live all the way in the Connecticut. They, I don't think I saw them tonight. Um, they were here last year, though, and if you voted early uh, this year, you would have seen it on display um, in the lobby at the town hall. Uh, moving on to our Past Perfect uh, catalog, we now have over 1,000 objects cataloged in our database, uh, and we have digitized uh, 428 photographs uh, from our collection, and can't thank uh, enough Becky Sattel, Joanne Spiro, and Anita Berwin for uh, helping uh, me on that, on that task. Um, we continue to catalog, archive, digitize, uh, and research the many other aspects of our collection, um, including researching um, a militia hat from our collection, 
which kind of nicely segues into our featured program. So just quickly on the hat before we get to what's behind the screen here. Um, so this hat, you can come up after the presentation to see it. Uh, it's on display in that case there. Um, this hat, I, we originally called it a helmet. It was actually given to the museum in 1946 by Mr. and Mrs. Charles Hambly as a late 19th, early 20th century firefighter's helmet. Well, a few months ago, actually, Anne uh, spoke to a visitor that came in um, to the museum one day, and he had some sp suspicions that this helmet was something else and maybe a little bit older than what we thought. Well, when we had Maria uh, Vasquez, who you'll be meeting very shortly, um, come to the museum along with her colleagues, uh, Patrick Donovan and, and Ryan Mayer, uh, they too viewed the, the hat and upon further research, it was actually determined not to be a firefighter's helmet, but a very rare uh, militia hat that definitely dates from 1795 to about 1810. So uh, it's over 200 years old. So that was very, a very exciting discovery. Um, and I have to mention this, given the fact that it was 200 years old, uh, it was, of course, displaying some signs of age. I think we would look a little aged after 200 years. Um, Patrick uh, Donovan, he applied a special solution that uh, will help pr uh, prevent any further uh, deterioration of the leather. And then Maria was so kind enough to build a special mount for, for it to stabilize the hat. Uh, this brings me to tonight's featured presentation, Understanding Our Flags from the Civil War and Earlier. Uh, certainly the highlight of tonight's presentation will be the 13 star flag that's behind the screen here. Uh, this flag was actually one of the first objects that was given to the society when uh, the museum opened in 1938. Uh, the flag came down through the Tallman family of Portsmouth, so it's always been in Portsmouth. Um, and what we're doing is we're currently determining the best course of action in conserving this amazing piece of Portsmouth history, along with the other flags in our collection. We have one other on display for you tonight. Um, and one of the experts to help us determine the best course of action has been Maria Vasquez. So Maria's expertise and passion is in textile conservation. She holds a master's degree in textile conservation from the University of Rhode Island. She has been on multiple PBS specials, including one documenting the conservation she performed on the oldest and most complete flag in North America, the Byfield flag. She is currently vice president of the Varnum Memorial Armory in East Greenwich and works full time as the collections manager for the Naval War College Museum in Newport. She is here tonight to give her take on the flags you see before you. So without further ado, I give you Maria Vasquez. While we lower the screen, um, the helmet over there is actually uh, believed to be only one of 10 in existence. I was just gonna say, yeah. <laughs> it's very rare. I know it sounds like, oh cool, it's neat that it's from that time period. Um, but there, yeah, there's probably only 10 hats in existence. The Rhode Island Historical Society has about three hats from around the same time period, either earlier or just about to that time period. The Varnum has one, you have one. <laughs> so Rhode yeah. New, New England and Rhode Island in general has a lot of um, the remaining hats from this time period. Um, you said the eagle plate. The, the eagle, so if you look at this hat, it is a um, very thick leather helmet. Um, you can see a lot of the cracking or crackleture, um, which I didn't actually think was a real word until I learned it. Um, around the outside of that, and that was causing a lot of flaking and red rot. Um, the red rot was uh, an inherent sort of fungus on the leather, and in order to combat that, we consolidated it with a Clusel G mixture. Um, and so essentially we sort of, in the conservation terms, we sort of painted the hat, right, to keep all the leather from wanting to continue to flake off and essentially continue to fall apart. Um, the front visor of the hat has a uh, eagle, a brass eagle on it. And that really elevates the hat from, yeah, that was probably militia to, oh my goodness, we can date this between this 20 year time period of when they would have used a militia hat. Because they didn't just go out of style every two years. Um, <laughs> so uh, what I did was I just created a silk 
um, corn for the inside of it because it was in this building when it didn't have climate control. The building would get very humid and the hat sort of started to lean because it had nothing holding it. And so it deformed sort of to the side. And in order to um, keep it healthy and happy for as long as possible, we want to not continue to fold. Um, and putting it on that mountain allows it to be, it also has like a little uh, uh, board that it's sitting on that the, the mountain is attached to. You can lift it up from the board and show it to people without actually having to handle the hat, which is very important. Um, so kind of the uh, exciting thing that y'all are here to listen to me talk about is this 13 star flag. Um, usually when people see 13 star flags, they get really excited thinking that this must be a revolutionary war era flag, um, period, to the actual war itself. Uh, and in order to figure out whether it is or not, there's a few things that we do. Um, the materials that would have been available to Americans at the time of the Revolutionary War were linen, uh, wool, and silk. Uh, and less so silk because we had to order from overseas, we didn't manufacture our own silk, whereas wool and linen we could manufacture ourselves. Uh, so, in order to make a flag like this um, in the Revolutionary War, you would use materials that were easy for you to come across. Wool bunting is one of those materials. The faded stripes that you see, um, so these that are closer to the hoist edge here, um, are original. Uh, you can see the fraying on the end of them. They're solid stripes. Um, this brighter color you see here is a little bit over there and some other pieces in places where they patched along the way. Those are replacement uh, fabrics. When I um, took a microscope and I analyzed the barest, tiniest little fragment of a thread for each one of these pieces from areas where it was already fraying, I was able to determine that in both the warp and the weft, so each direction of this material is wool bunting, so it's wool in each direction. And the brighter red color is uh, cotton in one direction and wool in the other. So that would have been post-Revolutionary War by itself. <laughs> um, this is a hand-sewn flag, so that's it good in the direction for being um, not in the 1870s, for instance, which if they were making it for the uh, centennial, they would have made it for, uh, they would have used a sewing machine, it's just easier. Um, so that means that it's earlier. And um, you might ask yourself, why would you recreate a 13 star flag? <laughs> why isn't it just obvious that it's a Revolutionary War era flag? And the reason behind that is that we were very proud of being Americans, of us fighting off the British, like essentially the first people to actually be able to fight off the British um, and gain our own independence. And so at every anniversary of that, <laughs> we celebrated that by making 15, uh, 13 star flags. Um, so even I imagine as we come up on the 250th anniversary of our country, you'll see more 13 star flags coming around and we know them now. We're like, oh, that's clearly a modern flag. <laughs> they would have known also at the time, like, oh, that's clearly a reproduction flag. Um, so this flag has um, stars that have been replaced. Uh, these two uh, in the center were, must have been so worn out that they were replaced at one time. This one as well. And the other ones you can see have holes in them and have seen a lot of uh, wear and damage. Um, so these stars are more original. So I uh, took threads from each of them to see if they were linen based and they're unfortunately cotton. Um, and then the thread that the flag is actually sewn with is also cotton. So what I mean when I say that um, it's easier to date it by what the fibers are made from is that um, the cotton gin wasn't invented until 1801. So cotton was stupidly expensive and pretty much essentially only came out of India prior to the 1800s. Um, uh, Europe had <coughs> cotton machines, but it was extremely expensive and they weren't as fine of a quality as uh, Indian manufacturing was. So it wasn't until the cotton gin was invented and it became very easy to make very fine cotton threads and therefore very co fine cotton fabrics uh, that it, cotton became cheap, and it, you're not going to make you're not going to use expensive materials to make a very wide swap. You're especially not going to use uh, cotton thread, which is even more difficult to make than the threads and uh, the yarns themselves. Um, you're not going to use cotton for that if it's going to be stupidly expensive. This is just a, a, essentially to them a thing you flew to represent a thing. It wasn't like you're putting thousands of dollars into it. You just wanted to be able to say, look, there's our, our America flag, right? And it doesn't matter like if, it, if it's broken in a few years or 
um, degrees in a few years, we'll just make another one, right? They weren't thinking 100 years from now, <laughs> they're going to really want this really this flag to be preserved. They weren't thinking about us historical societies, unfortunately. Um, so because it was so expensive to have cotton, we can say pretty uh, assuredly that anything that has cotton in it is post 1800s when it was easy for us to manufacture cotton. Um, so because there's cotton in the, uh, the stars, there's cotton in the thread, and that really leans toward, and in the hoist edge, the whole hoist edge is cotton fabric as well. Um, that really leans toward it being more 1825 time period as opposed to um, Revolutionary War time period. Uh, so this flag is probably from the 50th anniversary of our country, and it was just remade for that. And then um, you know people started collecting these things and trying to preserve them because by then we were already thinking, oh, we've been a country for 50 years. This is important. We sort of made it past those first hurtful years. <laughs> where we're still paying people back and trying to uh, figure out ourselves. Um, so like I was saying, we have uh, the blue canton is the upper left corner with the stars in it. Um, the striped star pattern, as opposed to, um, you can sort of see here, this is a circular star pattern. Um, if you guys want to come up after, it's a circular star pattern. Um, and even now we have sort of a, a grid work, but they did a lot of stars and circles. Uh, in early flags. And this striped pattern is kind of unique to Rhode Island, <laughs> as far as I can tell. A lot of the experts say that this is the very weird, and we're like, oh, <laughs> I can point you three flags <laughs> that have a, a striped star pattern that are early American. Um, so this is pretty unique to Rhode Island, which I think is pretty cool. Um, in the canton. And then a thing that you'll see on the outside is that there's all these rings that are added on. And actually, um, except for this flag, every other flag that Portsmouth Historical Society has, has these rings on it. Uh, and I think what they did was at some point they were hanging them, maybe around a town hall or for uh, maybe a 1970. Yeah, yeah. It could there. be here, it could be. We have a picture of it, they were hanging Oh, okay, them. here, wonderful. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so they were hanging them by the rings here. Um, so uh, probably at one of the centennial uh, celebrations, they, uh, or, you know, bicentennial celebrations, they were hanging them, and that's why those were stitched on there. Otherwise, they would have been, um, you see a, a, a rope at the top and bottom, they would have been attached to a, a flagpole by those ropes and stretched to fly. Um, so it would not have been hoisted by uh, the rings, that's a modern addition um, for this. Uh, some other fun things that you'll notice on this flag is there's some beautiful patchwork. This is a silk blend fabric that's got a beautiful paisley design. Um, that was probably done in the 1800s, late 1800s, to patch it. Um, there's a lot of love on this flag. There's a lot of patches on this side as well. And it all just goes to somebody hand stitch these things on to fill in the gaps to try to keep the flag going um, for many years, whether they thought it was Rev War, whether they knew it was 1820s time period um, for the 50th anniversary. Um, they treasured the flag as being a local piece of history. Um, that represented our freedom. So it's still a very historically relevant piece. Um, it's just not Rev War. <laughs> um, the flag we have over here is a Civil War era flag. It is a 34 star flag. And I wish I could show you the canton, but when, when I'm done talking and, and everyone else is done talking, you can come up and see it. It's got a circular design. Uh, it's actually concentric circles, so there's a star in the center, a, a, a set of circles, uh, stars around it, and a circular star set around that as well, and then one in each corner. Um, the 34 star flag is Civil War is 1861 to 1863 is when it would have been flown, um, and it's a naval flag. It again has these um, these ropes at the corners, which is a sort of a purely. Uh, Santa. <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> Whose ringtone is that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> ring? Oh, Civil War. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, this would have been a naval flag for a poor town. That makes sense. And um, it would have been flown between 1861 and 1863, which is the beginning of the war. Rhode Island sent something like, oh man, I'm thinking, maybe I'm thinking of the deaths. Rhode Island sent a large number of soldiers to fight in the Civil War. 
mostly volunteer, especially in the beginning. And these flags were very precious to us because they represented each unit that went off to battle. Um, so these are very special pieces that were handmade usually by the ladies of, so I would, I would almost say it was maybe a ladies of Portsmouth sort of a flag kind of a thing. Um, and they would you know, send them off with ships and things like that um, in order to give them sort of like a memento, like remember me when you see this, right? It'll, it'll make you wanna fight harder for home when you're further away. Uh, so these pieces are very important in that way. This one's seen a lot of um, TLC since then. Somebody cut off sort of the raw edges and folded over the end again and hand stitched with a, a thicker thread than the rest of the flag is stitched with in order to keep it from falling apart and sort of ending up with tatters on the edge. Um, this is a smaller flag, so this probably, if it was on a ship, would have been sort of uh, the aft flag on the back of the ship uh, near the boom. Um, and so it's, it's, seen, it's seen a lot of wear. There's a section at the bottom of the canton. It's almost like um, this big on this flag where there was a, a patch job. And the way the stars are stitched on, they are um, paper pieced. So someone can make a star template out of paper. And then they essentially cut 34 of those or um, 68. And then they would put a star on each side of the flag and then stitch it down so that you had a perfect star on each side. You wouldn't have like, um, I guess this one's not like that. Sometimes they'll stitch a star on one side and then cut out the extra on the back of it so you can still sort of see it on both sides but one side is bigger than the other. Um, so a lot of tender loving care went into this uh, flag, which I think is pretty awesome. I love seeing paper piecing techniques and they're very, it's a very Rhode Island thing to have done during the Civil Wars is the second flag I've seen like that in this area, the other ones at the bottom. Um, so yeah, uh, that's mostly it. It looks like there's a sort of a dark uh, stripe on this. I imagine it was sitting on a table or had one then folded underneath at one, at one point and that's why it's sort of smudged or covered in smut. Uh, it could have been like in a smoking area where somebody, a lot of people were walking by and looking at it and like all the smoke sort of landed on it. Um, could have been at a fair or something to that effect where there's a lot of grease in the air and things like that. Um, but it, something happened to it where it was just, the top side got a lot uh, really dirty, but that has nothing to do with um, sunlight per se. Um, and that's about that for the flag. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, hold on. I got one. <laughs> How do you go to your museum? My museum, the New War College Museum, yeah. or my museum, the Varnum? Yeah, which, which, which one's which? Okay, so the Varnum is in East Greenwich, Rhode Island. It's okay. the Varnum Memorial Armory. Um, we do open house uh, visits every month. They're usually on a Sunday. Uh, it's free. You can, the, the public can just come and enjoy. It's usually from 11 to 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, well, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, and we would love to have everybody if they'd like to come. Um, I'm usually a docent or I'm doing conservation work in the bathroom because that's where my lab is and you can come see me in my, um, <laughs> my uh, climate, my, my bowl. <laughs> um, and if you want to come to the Naval War College Museum, we are down the street in Newport. Unfortunately, we are on, on the Naval Base, so you have to plan that in advance. You have to say, hey, I want to come on this day at this time and we put you in the vetting log. Um, you have to have a, um, a real ID with a yellow star on it in order to be able to get on base or a valid passport or something. Um, they just require specific forms of ID. And then um, you stop at our pass and ID office and you get permission to come on base. They give you a pass and you come on base and you come to the museum. You have six uh, exhibit halls open uh, rooms and we just put up an exhibit on the USS Constellation. Uh, I am also an anchor expert. <laughs> we love anchors. So you need an appointment for the naval that's that's the one that you need to the either con you contact the museum so museum at usnwc.edu um, or you can go onto our website and uh, it'll give you all the instructions um, on the website you just look up Naval War College Museum. Yeah. Just curious, what's the most interesting or the most challenging textile that you've conserved? In Okay, I can definitely answer this. <laughs> so the most difficult thing I've ever conserved, I'm working on right now, uh, it's a Door Rebellion flag. Does anyone, how, how Door Rebellion, does everyone know about this? My we had a lecture on it. Wonderful, cool. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's a Door Rebellion flag, and there's actually a combination 
where someone cut a door rebellion flag, sort of cut off the essentially the extra bits, right? Like whoosh, cut it, and then they added on a um, suffrage flag. So it's sort of two flags combined into one. So like, oh, we don't want to lose these, so they all sew them together. Um, and the door rebellion one is a uh, canvas that's painted on both sides, and pardon me, it's got a, an eagle and a beautiful emblem, and it says uh, to prepare for peace. No to preserve peace, prepare for war in the ribbon at the bottom. Um, and that is so, because it's painted on both sides, as soon as it's in a bad climate, people start manipulating it, like folding it or rolling it. Uh, the tension on the, the paint just cracks it. Uh, so essentially what happened is this got cracked all over and people started stitching it back together. And it's a, you know essentially like, a, like, think of a painting and think of trying to just sew it back together. Um, so that did not work at all. Um, so there's just holes now, and people have started taping it back together. So I had to remove tape, all the stitch holes, um, and then sort of put Humpty Dumpty back together again so you can read all the words. Um, so now I had to learn paper conservation techniques. It's not a textile conservation at that, at that point. Um, so painting and then paper and, and sort of combine it all in, in order to fix it. So essentially another degree or two worth of information in order to conserve a flag. <laughs> So yeah, that's definitely the most complicated thing I've ever worked on. And okay. you know, one of the fun things about learning about uh, the helmet there, Maria was here um, and walking around at our displays. Now we've been open since 1938 and we have a lot of donations in And she said to me, what can you tell me about this flame stitch wallet? And it's really a chevron, beautiful pink fabric. And I said, not really a lot. I thought it was a woman's purse. It's actually a man's wallet that it would have taken into battle. So I don't know if you want to tell us a smidgen about that. So when you go downstairs, you can look at it. Yeah, so they would have been called wallets. Um, and they were extremely, extremely popular for men. Women had pockets, right? So you would have a, a sort of a pocket that was on a string and you would just tie it onto your waist over your um, corset and you had a skirt you could reach through um, your skirt into your pockets. So you didn't have, women didn't have wallets at the time. Uh, men did. And they had the, the sort of Vogue at the time was this beautiful, they call it a flame stitch. When you go downstairs, you'll see it. It's a sort of a zigzag um, design, and it's like, I think yours is like gold and then pink and then like a fuchsia or something. It's a little bit faded. Um, but you essentially open it, and it's, it's sort of like a woman's wallet is nowadays. There's pockets for papers and things and your money. Um, and there's multiples of them that I've seen, especially at the Rhode Island Historical Society, that have the name of soldiers on the inside and their rank and like they'll date it and stuff like that so we know that they were used during the revolutionary war um so they're very popular <laughs> so that's a really unique piece that yeah. you know it's, it's stuff like that wandering around that i'm just like hey do you know anything about that <laughs> and we always thank you i was downstairs you. with carrie and i found it's it's a shame that we missed the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor uh, last year because you guys have a off the USS Arizona, which was one of the ships that was sunk in Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. and then went off to get rebuilt and was the ship that they signed the Japanese surrender on. So whatever sailor owned that hat, and potentially more, we can find the rest of the uniform here, was either on it when it sank or when it was the surrender was being signed. Which huge piece of history, <laughs> and it's just sitting in a box, and no one knew what it was or the significance of it, so I'm having fun going through all of your stuff, <laughs> that's what I'm trying to say. Well, we thank you so much. It's, I think, did somebody else, oh, Jim had a question. What's this look like on the other side? It essentially looks the same thing. The stars are the same on the other side, like I said, that sort of paper piecing technique, um, and, um, you know, yeah, it's essentially the same. Some of these places like this is just sort of cut off on the back side. You can see on the front here that they just sort of cut the frayed ends at the top of this red part here um, and didn't finish it off in any other way. So essentially it's the same exact thing. Can you just tell them about the other fourth the flag you have at the uh, Naval War College Museum? Yes. So we have uh, another flag at the Naval War College Museum. Ours we had uh, uh, conserved and mounted. Um, so the, I think URI did the conservation and they custom dyed all of this fabric to match the faded shade of red that the stripes on the flag are. Um, and so it's mounted to a board and it's in a, a frame on our wall. And you can imagine like this is roughly the same size, a little bit uh, smaller perhaps. Um, and we just have it on the wall in our stairwell so it's not on an outside wall, which conducts a lot of heat and coldness. So it's, you don't want things on outside walls. 
Um, but so it's, it's very similar. So it has cotton stars and it has cotton thread stitching it together. Um, so we think that both of them are from 1825 time period. Um, but you guys sort of clustered your 13 star flags together, <laughs> which is pretty cool. It, it makes me think that they potentially were, um, you know, town flags, uh, or, or somebody really, really liked 13 stars and just started hoarding them. But I really think um, that they were probably used in some kind of celebration or something like that and flown for a while and they ended up just sort of here because they were all used in Portsmouth. Very cool flag collection. We have a 34. W w um, thank you so, so much. We really appreciate it. We're, we're, keeping, we're keeping Maria busy. She's very, very generous with her time and coming to see us. And while we're, can we put the screen back up? Gary, were you going to do that? Um, while they're putting the screen back up, I don't know if you saw over the summer, we had a huge turnout. We, uh, when they were coming to look at the, just, um, the flags, we have a 34 star flag that is um, almost as big as the conference, our new conference table that we got through the generosity of uh, Senator Seventy and the chairs for, uh, from Terry, Terry Courtmand. But it, we were leaving it aired out and that's the one that got picked up by the press. And um, I think it was 1861, it was the, there was only a very short blip of time where there was a 34 star flag and Abraham Lincoln had to decide whether or not he was going to revert back to the 33 star flag or keep it at the 34, which was the state. There was a state that succeeded. I can't remember. It's on our it's on our website. But anyway, that one's 34, and it went to 18, 1861 to 1863. I think you're thinking about the next one, which was Kansas. Kansas, yeah. And then it was around for some more period of time. But anyway, we have another ginormous uh, flag. We and you know it's something that um, we've known that we've had this cool flag collection, but we really uh, finally found the experts um, who were able to help us identify and. Obviously, preserving these, conserving them, would be uh, high on our list, but also extremely expensive. Okay, so, so thank you again for that. Um, afterward, when this is over, you feel free to please to come up and take a look. There you can see there's do not touch signs all over them for good reason. And then there's also some Christmas-related um, objects in this, very old Christmas-related objects from our collection in that case. Okay, so um, special recognitions. We are, we've been very fortunate as we've reached out into the community, as people have learned more about the Portsmouth Historical Society, to have various experts um, share their uh, time and talent with us, which is great. Renee Walker-Tuttle also lives in Portsmouth, and she's also uh, a textile and flag expert, and she has come to take a look as well. Um, in memory, I'm life member Joy Scher. So Joy Scher uh, passed away a few months ago. She was a little girl in 1938 when we began, when the Portsmouth Historical Society came into existence. And I just thought it would be really appropriate to just say a few words, um, just mention her so that we remember her. She had a lifetime membership. She grew up literally in this um, organization. Her mother was Ruth Earl, who was Jolly from Girl Scouts. Remember Girl Scouts? And um, there's a lot of stories about um, the Girl Scouts coming in and blowing the bellows back there. I mean, she was here for over 50 years, actively involved in the Portsmouth Historical Society. Her family is still in town. And it, uh, when I was a Girl Scout le uh, leader years ago, this makes sense to me now because it was always standard operating procedure. Every year you did a field trip to the Portsmouth Historical Society with your troop. And now I know why. Um, I had not made, I did not know that connection with Ruth Earl. I knew Ruth Earl, I didn't, and I may have met Joy, but I just didn't. <laughs> I just thought it would be appropriate to take a moment to acknowledge someone who was critically important to the Historical Society for a very long time. And interestingly enough, um, coincidentally, we're talking about an activity to bring um, children and students back in to, to create a, an Historical Society um, badge and a scavenger hunt and sort of reintroduce uh, the scouting community, 4-H, you know, youth groups, to the Historical Society by having, um, having a program for them um, to, to get to know us and to you know, sort of get them invested in and excited about history and become future members and supporters. Um, these are all our special community partners, all of whom uh, really join us in, in our different events and activities um, with donations and allowing us the use of their facilities. Um, 
and we and mostly in our events. So as you look at those, we hope that you uh, will think kindly of them and and also um, what's the word I'm looking for? Patronize them. Thank you. Uh, so we're so we we make we're making really really good time. We are just about done. How can you help? Well, you can become a volunteer. You can increase your level of giving, renew your membership, recruit new members, become a new member, uh, donate to our collection if you have things hanging around. There's a lot of people out there in the community who are historians and who um, have things that, that they don't realize are historically significant. And um, so if you're cleaning out, helping some, clean out someone's attic, don't just automatically th throw things away. We already talked about using Amazon um, Smile. And lastly, uh, when you go downstairs, uh, there, is a ta there is going to be a table uh, that has membership forms. We also have um, tax letters already written out. If you want to do a nice little end of the year donation, we can give you your tax letter, uh, donation letter right away. And we have Portsmouth Historical Society Christmas ornaments for sale. They're really pretty. So if you need any gifts or you just want to buy one to put on your tree, those will be down there along with uh, Portsmouth, our Portsmouth compacts. So in conclusion, thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate your support, um, your camaraderie, all the things that you bring to the table for us and, and helping us fulfill our mission. And um, I'm now going to show um, a list of our corporate sponsors. Does anyone have any questions? Jim. Oh, yes, there's books for sale. Any questions at all? We, uh, as Ann mentioned earlier, it takes two people to fill her shoes. Ah! <laughs> so we would let's just want to recognize Ann for her four, three, two, three years. Three and a half. Three and a half. Ten, Ten years on the board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. That's very nice. Thank you. The big shoes to fill, and uh, we're looking for. Well, thank you for being a great present. <laughs> <laughs> no, but again, Ann, thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful thank you. job. Yes. I mean, we're sitting in a, in a facility that wasn't, we weren't able to do this two years ago. And through the uh, master plan we have with the society, and uh, Ann's leaving us in really good hands as far thank as you. Uh, her support. Yeah, Honestly, I'm like. We, we can't imagine how much work she put into this. Society the past three and a half yes. years. Thank, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, my, my mother is here, my son Connor, my daughter Chelsea, they can attest. <laughs> but it, and, and I thank you both for saying that. It's been a real pleasure. I actually still am working. I, I have, I'm a real estate broker, so it's been this and, and working. And it's time to let somebody else bring in some fresh ideas and, and um, sign up. Sign up. We're it's a fun group. Come it join is. us. I, I, I do hope you got kind of the sense. I know I breezed through the bi business portion, but there's so much fun stuff going on here. There, there really is. We have a great collection and a great group of people. So, you know, it's, imp it's important. I think we add a lot of value to the town um, as well. So I'd like to thank you again. And in conclusion, <laughs> there's a lot. There's Portsmouth Punch downstairs. It's sort of a secret recipe that, that's been handed down like literally for generation after generation. Lots of food and beverages, and now it's time to just relax and mingle. Enjoy. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.